Uh, Y'all remember King David, who by God's grace and by his faith in his youth slayed the lion and a bear who were attempting to have lamb chops for dinner that night. Y'all remember King David who brought down a giant of a man by the name of Goliath with a slingshot and a stone to protect all of Israel. Y'all remember King David, the only one in all of scripture to be called a man after God's own heart. A man of passion and purpose, destiny, mentioned in the New Testament more than any other human. He was a poet, musician, warrior who stood courageous in battles, trusting and depending on God time after time. King David, who declared and decreed in judgment with wisdom and equity and ruled with humility and integrity most of the time. More importantly, who served and loved God with the very fibers of his being. But who also, like all of us, falls short at times. He has a brief season of chasing his own desires of being an infirm father, abusing his authority and leading with partiality, which causes him at moments to forfeit the people's trust and respect. Yet he gets back on track because he has a steadfast and unmovable prayer life in which he demonstrates great repentance and again, dependence on God. Matter of fact, this very psalm is often called a prayer or a poem of worship. King David understood that God is not a genie granting wishes, but a father who takes seriously the sincere request of his children. And King David made it known that God was a priority in his life. Even on his way from time temporal to time eternal, David gave his final words to his son Solomon to make God a priority saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong. Show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do, he wanted his son Solomon to prioritize God as well. So just in case someone forgot or simply did not know, it is this King David that informs us in these six verses of a God that knows us. It is this King David who has a personal, deep-rooted relationship with God that masterfully and poetically writes about certain aspects and attributes of God that are uniquely true about God and nothing or no one else. David faced many trials and adversities but finds rest in a God who knows him. This psalm in its entirety speaks of those attributes one through six is God's omniscience, 7 through 12, God's omnipresence, and 12 to 24, God's omnipotence. But our focus this morning will be on 1 through 6, God's omniscience, that God is all-knowing. Let the church say (laughs) all-knowing. Again, David communicates that God has total knowledge and is acutely aware of everything, present, past, future, today, yesterday, and forevermore, all at the same time that nothing and no one takes God by surprise. God is never caught off guard by new information. His knowledge is limitless without boundaries. God has no capacity in his capabilities of knowing. We have a capacity, God does not. God does not learn or is not enlightened and nothing can be added to him or subtracted from him. He already knows all there is to know and all that can be known and he knows it all perfectly and completely. Church, God's knowledge is immeasurable. My words are not even adequate or eloquent enough to explain to you all God's knowledge because has thou not known Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fain if not this part right here? There's no searching of his understanding. The Bible says, for who has known the mind of God? But I'm going to try my best to explain it to y'all. Amen? Listen. We all have some knowledge, but only God has all knowledge. So David expresses in these verses that God knows everything. But he dives a little deeper by saying not only does God know everything, but he knows everything about us. 
God knows everything about you. Chew on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Every single minute detail of our lives, God knows it. David says God has searched us and he knows us. And don't get this confused with searching for us. God knows exactly where we are, but he searches us, our hearts and our minds and the innermost part of our beings. Therefore, he knows every atom, every bone structure, every chamber of the heart, every thought process, every system. Church, God knows us. And knowing this text is the Hebrew word yada, meaning not just to know, but to know intimately, without anything hidden. God knows us intimately, intrinsically, exclusively, passionately, emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically, creatively, and any other L-Y word you want to add on to the list, God knows it. He thoroughly acquaints himself with our being. He knows our ups and our downs, our ins, our outs, our thoughts, our ways, our failures, our successes, our secrets, our lusts, our desires, our hearts, our prayer life or lack thereof, our concerns, our fears. He knows our hangups, our hangouts, our hookups, and our low downs. Church, God knows it all. He knows when we make a joyful noise and when we give people a piece of our mind, when we use words of wisdom and words that aren't pleasing in anyone's sight, let alone God's. When we are giving and selfish, when we are loving and hateful, he knows our good deeds and our sins. God knows the us that nobody knows, guess what, including us. David says he knows when we sit and when we rise, he perceives our thoughts from afar. He discerns our going out and our lying down. He's familiar with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongues, he knows it completely. God knows us. God has a detailed knowledge of who we are and even what we are yet to be. But then David goes on to say, not only does God know us, but he knows us in this way, that because he understands us, he hems us in, behind and before. In my milk days, in my youth, that verse excited me to no end because I looked at that verse as God's protection, that he had me surrounded on every side, in God I am secure. I thought of him in being like a car that has blocked me in. I don't know if you ever came out of somewhere and your car is blocked in, and then you gotta back up, pull up, back up, pull, oh, that gets on my last nerve. Why did they park so close to me? But as I studied the text, I learned that the word him in this context is still used as in to secure, as in protection, and we can shout on that, but not like a cramped parking space, but more like a city that is laid under siege. Uh-oh, that's different. Uh, to hem in or to encircle is not just a hedge of protection, but it is more like barbed wire on a prison fence, and we are the prisoners captured by God. Remember, Brother Paul said, for this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is being surrounded by God on every side, but it is also him choosing not to leave us alone ever, even when we want him to. I know we are all in our meat days now. We are all saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And we would never say we want God to leave us alone with our mouths. But sometimes our actions speak louder than our words. A church, God searches us out thoroughly like a great detective and won't stop searching us ever. And for those of us who will tell the truth and shame the devil at times, that can be a bit much. I know I'm not the only person here this morning who has treated God like the third wheel on a good date. God, why are you here? Go back home and be a good God. I'll catch you on Sunday morning. At times, I feel hemmed in. At times, I don't want to be a preacher. At times, I don't want to be under the microscope. At times, I wish God didn't know this part of me or that part of me. I feel him in. Him then is the Christian's awareness that God is fully aware of us, that he's omniscient. At times, this understanding of his knowledge of me tugs at the flesh and blood of me that wishes he didn't know everything about me. 
if only for a second. It is a fleeting desire to want God to know me deeply and intimately at this moment but not at another, to know Beyonce, but not Sasha Fierce, uh, to know David Banner, but not the Incredible Hulk, uh, to know Dr. Jekyll, but not Mr. Hyde. For an example, it is how some people treat me when I officiate a wedding. At the ceremony, I am high and lifted up, almost reverent, so to speak. Why? Because you can't have the ceremony without the efficient, right? But, let the church say but. But when I arrive at the reception, oh shucks, some people don't want me there too long. You done ain't going home now, preacher. It doesn't matter how wonderful or efficient I've been at the wedding. Why? Because people feel like I'm searching them out. They feel hemmed in. They can't be their most authentic self around me. But on the other hand, sometimes I feel hemmed in at the reception when I'm uncomfortable as the woman of God exposing my most authentic self, especially when the Moscato is calling me to have personal communion. I'm about to hide it in a red cup, amen? When I want to be the first one to jump up and do the Tootsie Roll, mm-hmm. I ain't been out in a while, I don't know the latest dances, amen. But listen, God loves us so much. David says that he refuses to make us comfortable when we are uncomfortable with his searching of us. Again, just sometimes we don't want to be searched or hemmed in by God if it's only for a second. But church, I have lived long enough to know those moments for me are short-lived because I truly would not want it any other way. And because God searches us, he knows us, flaws and all. And because he loves us unconditionally, he hems us in and won't let us go. Hallelujah. Because even when we think we want him to let go and his omniscience and his all-knowing, he knows the plans he has for us, plans to prosper us and plans to give us a hope and a future and not to harm us even when we want to harm ourselves even when we want to give up God won't let go even when we want to give in God won't let go even when we want to turn back God won't let go even when we turn our backs on him God won't let go even when we are faithless God won't let go even when we are sinking deep in sin God won't let go Go. Even when we deny him, God won't let us go. Just ask Brother Peter. Matter of fact, after the denial, God pulled Peter a little closer and began the commission that he put on his life and used Peter to build his church, saying, Upon this rock uh, I shall build my church, uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this. Family, God got us, and he will never ever let us go. Even if your mother and father forsake you, God won't let you go because he's a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless. Even when our enemies came upon us to eat up our flesh, God won't let go.